My name is Matt King. I'm in my fourth year here at the University of South Florida. Before that, I spent six years in Minnesota working on my PhD and finishing my PhD. And before that, I grew up born and raised in Seattle, Washington. So I've come a long way from uh, the Northwest United States down here in the Southeast. But I feel very fortunate to be able to speak to all of you about this topic, which is kind of an offshoot project from the book that Smitty uh, so kindly mentioned. My goal for this talk is to be accessible to non-specialists, uh, but to have something to offer to all of you. I know we have a variety of people who are here with varying degrees of expertise in the field of history, anthropology, Mediterranean studies, and that sort of thing. So hopefully I'm able to uh, do justice to this topic by talking about this twofold pillaging here, the medieval pillaging of ancient ruins that fed the economy of people living among Roman ruins and the colonial pillaging of the history of these medieval Muslims whose remains were destroyed by largely French archeologists. I have chat open uh, I'm glad the audio Sherry is working okay. Uh, I'll do my best to answer questions along the way. It might be easier. I don't know how you guys normally do these things to do it at the end. So we'll just sort of play that by ear for now. So to make sure that we're all geographically oriented, here we have a, the map that is the centerpiece of what we're talking about today. This is the medieval Mediterranean home to coexistence and conflict across religious lines. It's easy to think of the Middle Ages as a time of backwards retreat into tribalism and lack of education, hence the term Dark Ages that unfortunately proliferates in the popular sphere. But this, this was not the case. And we have really incredible accounts of interfaith cooperation, of Christians and Muslims sailing on the same ships, of Muslims and Christians fighting alongside each other in battle, and of social interactions across and within religious lines. If you're interested in this sort of thing, we've had two books recently come out. Sorry about the crappy quality on the leftmost image. The Light Ages and the Bright Ages, which as you can imagine, are both trying to sort of uh, debunk this idea of the Middle Ages as a dark period. But that's not what I'm here to do today. Uh, don't have enough time for that right now. We're going to be looking specifically at the middle of the Mediterranean, the territory roughly akin to modern day Tunis, which in the Middle Ages was called Ifriqiya. I think that was the word Smitty uh, stumbled on when pronouncing my book name, and that's my fault. I should have given you the pronunciation. I forget that most people aren't just embedded in the world of medieval Arabic most of the time. So this region of Ifriqiya comprises much of Tunisia, eastern Algeria, and western Libya. And it's less than 100 miles from Sicily. It's possible to cross between these two landmasses without losing sight of water on a clear day if you keep near the intermediate islands like Pantelleria, Malto, and Gozo. There are environmental similarities between these two places in terms of climate, but there's also some distinctions that's worth bringing up. In Sicily, there is greater elevation. There are Sirocco winds from uh, North Africa and Southern Sicily that lead to uh, like a more harsh climate in the south but, and a wetter climate in the north due to geographic uh, peculiarities of winds coming from the Italian peninsula. And there were close relations between these two uh, environments during the ancient and medieval periods. This is seen most clearly in the ancient world in the Punic Wars from 264 to 146 BCE that pitted the Romans against the Carthaginians. The largest city of the Carthaginians, perhaps obviously, was the coastal city of Carthage, which is starred in the upper right-hand corner of the map that you see. The Romans eventually conquered Carthage, sacked the city, and then supposedly salted the fields around it so that crops would not grow, though this was probably an embellishment from later sources. Still, the hatred between these two groups, the Romans and the Carthaginians, was very, very real. Cato, Cato the censor, a politician of the Roman Republic, reportedly said Carthago delenda est at the end of all of his speeches, which means Carthage must be destroyed. It's kind of the Roman equivalent of ending any speech on the Senate floor, regardless of the content with make America great again or, or something like that. Cato was just determined to see Carthage fall. And even though the Romans sacked Carthage, they eventually realized its, uh, its utility as an agricultural center. This region of Ifriqiya which you see here in the map isn't really reflective of what it looked like in the ancient world. It was much greener back then. 
And this area along the northern coast of Tunisia and Algeria uh, is commonly referred to as the breadbasket of the Roman Empire because it was common for wheat to be grown there and exported to Rome's major cities on the Italian peninsula for it, where it would feed the people. We don't really see that in the satellite maps, but that's, uh, that was the reality of it at the time. And the Romans recognized that in that sort of potential for agriculture and resettled the area and made it their own complete with Roman administrative buildings and incorporated it into their, their province of Africa proconsularis, which eventually is going to be adapted into the Arabic Ifriqiya. Although Arabic geographers are quick to say that, no, it's definitely not from the Romans because they want to, it, to attribute it to a Muslim Lord, even though it, it's clearly a, etymologically from the Latin Africa. Here's a look at the modern contours of the site of Carthage. So this is a shot from Google Earth, just shot top down. Uh, right now, Carthage is a fairly affluent suburb of the much, much larger city of Tunis. And I'll show you the relation between the two in a second. Uh, right now, it's possible to take a light rail from the old city of Tunis to Carthage, passing through the poor areas of the city that, that saw intense protests in 2010 and 2011 during the Tunisian revolution, but then you get off the light rail and it's this like almost like California-esque suburb, really peaceful and quiet and kind of jarring actually compared to most of the rest of Tunis. The ancient site most clearly visible on this map, which uh, will, uh, here, let me just point it out to, point it out to are these dual harbors located here and here. One of them was for military uses, the other for commercial uses. But there are other Roman sites that exist in this uh, topography as well that are less obvious from what Google Maps shows us. We have the Lamalga cisterns, which are gonna be very important when we talk about the Arabic, uh, or the, the Muslim inhabitation of the site in the Middle Ages. We have the remains of a once great amphitheater. We have the baths of the Roman Empire Emperor Antoninus along the coast. And we have uh, the Bursa Hill, which I'm gonna be talking about in detail in a little bit. These structures were, uh, that the Romans constructed were adapted by post-Roman groups like the Vandals and the Byzantines. The pagan structures of the Romans were turned into churches and administrative buildings of the Romans turned into more imposing fortress-like structures. Today, a number of buildings from the ancient Carthaginians and Romans survived commonly seen as like, this is the heyday of Carthage. And here we have an artistic rendition of Roman Carthage around the second century CE. The big thing to note here is the aqueduct, which doesn't exist around, Carth or around Tunisia as we, uh, or sorry, it doesn't exist around Carthage today, but would have dominated the landscape back in the ancient world. At one point, this aqueduct, which we call the Zagwan Aqueduct, uh, because it runs 82 miles from Zagwan in inland Tunisia to Carthage, uh, was one of the most impressive feats of Roman engineering ever. It's unclear, based on this uh, uh, illustration, how exactly the aqueduct terminated at Carthage, but some of the water almost certainly was stored at the Lamalga cisterns, which are not really drawn by the author, but you can get a sense of where it are, where they are based on where the aqueduct ends. And then some of it probably went to the baths of Antoninus as well, because baths require uh, lots of hot, fresh water. The fortified area of the city with Roman government buildings atop it was the Bursa Hill, and nearby it was the amphitheater. The, when we talk about the layout of medieval Carthage and the pillaging of the ruins, the aqueduct, cisterns, amphitheater, and Bursa Hill, the four that essentially aren't the baths here, are going to be the most important for us to remember. They're the ones that are gonna be most referenced and or inhabited by groups during the Middle Ages and beyond. If you go to Carthage today, here's what things will look like on the ground. Much of it is protected, but because it is a UNESCO heritage site, uh, but not all of the ruins have survived from ancient times and even fewer of them from medieval times. So what we're seeing here are two uh, pieces of historic architecture, uh, on the Bursa Hill. The one on the top left is the Phoenician ruins of Carthage, which predate the Romans. And then on the bottom right is the uh, Cathedral of St. Louis, St. Louis from the 19th century, which we'll get into much later. We can see these two cities in relation 
relation to one another in this bad pixelated picture, sorry about that, where you see the cathedral kind of overlooking uh, the ruins situated sort of atop of the Bursa Hill. Here's what the cisterns of La Malga look like. Uh, I'll give you a medieval description of it soon enough. These were pieces of uh, like, you know, large tubes for water storage uh, that later were used as makeshift homes and storage facilities, as well as places for animals to rest. The bats of Antonius, meanwhile, are gorgeous and overlook the Mediterranean Sea and are quite well preserved relative to some of the other Roman sites. Disappointingly, the amphitheater of Carthage is uh, more or less no more. We have, you know, uh, a base level and some of the substructure available to us, but that doesn't do justice to what it would have looked like in the ancient world or uh, indeed during the medieval period. I'm going to read from you now to you now about a uh, description of the amphitheater of Carthage that, Carthage that comes to us from the famed Muslim geographer Muhammad al-Adrisi, who lived in Sicily during the 12th century of the Common Era and had access to eyewitness accounts of the amphitheater of Carthage. The city of Carthage was, at the time of its construction, among the most extraordinary of the known lands. Within it, the buildings were wondrous, as was the demonstration of the craftsmanship required to build them. Now the remnants of the buildings of the Rum, which means Romans, are well known. For example, the theater has no equal among the buildings of the earth with respect to its craftsmanship and size. Indeed, this theater has the structure of a circle, which is around 50 arches that soar into the air. The size of each arch is more than 30 spans, meaning the width of a hand. Between each arch and its sister is a magnificent column. The size of each column and their supports is four and a half spans. Standing upon each arch from these arches are five additional arches, one after the other, each with the same character construction of stone that is not like any other kind with respect to quality. Atop each arch from the surface is a circular C, which depicts images and there's a circular sea on the lower surface on which is depicted a variety of images and engravings on wondrous statues standing fixed in stone, including people, artisans, animals, and boats. All of these carvings were made with masterful craftsmanship and the most pronounced wisdom. The rest of this building, the, the rest of this towering building is very smooth and does not have a thing on it. It is said that this building used to be a stadium and a gathering place during a given season and day of the year. And even though we don't have a sense of what the amphitheater of Carthage looks like today beyond this description, we can maybe assume it looked a bit like the nearby amphitheater of El Gem, uh, which is also located in modern day Tunisia, or we could draw upon the you know, famed example of the Roman Colosseum itself. You get a sense that this would be an impressive structure with arch upon arch, engravings all over, uh, clearly a place to assemble and also potentially a place to fortify yourself if you're in need of a cheap accessible fortification. Now the Zagwan Aqueduct, I mentioned that it doesn't exist in Tunis proper anymore, but there are still remnants of it, uh, including at its, uh, the, the origin point at Zagwan itself, as well as in that 82 mile stretch running through towards Tunis. The same geographer, Muhammad al-Adrisi, described the aqueduct and its terminus. Among the wonders of the construction of Carthage are the cisterns, of which there are 24 in a line. The length of each cistern is 130 steps by 26 steps in width. Each cistern has a vault above it. Between each cistern and its neighbor are holes and passages that bring water from one to the other. All of them have been constructed with great wisdom. Water used to run to the cistern from the spring of Shakar, which is close to Kairawan. That's the Arabic term for Zagwan. The distance that this water ran from the spring to the cistern was three days. The running of water from this spring to these cisterns was on a number of arches. Their number was uncountable, and a moderate amount of water ran over them. These solid arches were built of stone. Those that were on high ground were short. Those that were on the belly of the, or sorry, those that were on the high ground were tall, while those that were on the belly of the earth were short. The grooves of these arches were at the top of their height. It is one of the most marvelous things I've seen on the face of the earth. So again, this medieval geographer bestowing praise upon the aqueduct of Carthage and the cisterns that bore the water there. Even though we have this medieval testimony to speak about Carthage during the time of the 12th and 13th century, scholarly focus on these ruins has overwhelmingly been ancient. 
Indeed, we have these big impressive stone structures that have deteriorated, been destroyed by natural disasters and pillaged by humans since antiquity. The Phoenicians and Romans get the most fanfare here because they were the ones who mostly constructed them. But I think there's a fascinating story too to be told about these structures after the fall of Rome and how they were used after their initial construction. And the medieval period in this sense is generally neglected. Usually the Carthaginians and Romans followed by the Vandals and the Byzantines are the ones to receive the most attention. And Dexter Hoyos, who wrote a great, great uh, monograph on Carthage, you see here, it ends with the Muslim conquest and what he calls the so-called fall of Carthage. Looking at the medieval sources though, to me at least shows that this isn't really the case. The city of Carthage had a vivid afterlife, uh, if we wanna call it that, as a fortified place for Muslim lords and as a strategic location through which valuable marble and pre-cut stone could be shipped across the Mediterranean. To understand uh, this argument and just the, the milieu in which these Muslim lords operated, I need to give a little bit of a history lesson here. So in the seventh century of the common era, Muslim armies conquered North Africa and began a centuries long process of Islamization followed by Arabization. So the process through which people convert to Islam and people begin speaking Arabic, Arabic being uh, inextricably intertwined with Islam. Here we have a map that shows like the, the dot to the left is Tunis, the old city of Tunis. The dot to the right is the side of Carthage that I was just showing you. And the street grid here is, is the modern one of Tunis, perhaps given away by the airport kind of in the middle. Now, when Muslims began building up Tunis and fortifying it, uh, they used uh, Carthage as a way station or resting place. And if you're asking like, well, why didn't they just use these ruins for themselves? Well, it was commonplace during the early Muslim conquests for dynasties to not just like take over cities that they had conquered, but to found new cities on their own. And that's where we get cities like Baghdad, for example. It wasn't enough to conquer these ancient cities in Mesopotamia, these Muslim lords wanted to conquer and create cities on their own. Over the centuries, Tunis gradually eclipsed Carthage in importance as a regional center of power in the larger region of Ifriqiya. And with the rise of Tunis, Carthage evolved from this series of interrelated structures to a cluster of villages for those living on the outskirts of Tunis with ancient structures largely adapted for residential use. This was commonplace throughout the Middle Ages. The Colosseum of Rome, for example, was used for housing and shops throughout the 14th century. And we know this largely from archeological evidence. Tunis, as it grew, benefited from its proximity to the ruins of Carthage through the appropriation of marble. The geographer Al-Bakri, who wrote about a century before Al-Adrisi in the middle of the 11th century, gives a rhyming jingle uh, that sort of, sort of subtly disses the city of Tunis. The Arabic reads, Dor Tunis Abwabuha Rocham We Dahaluha Socham. So the, the words Rocham and Socham rhyme here. And it just says around Tunis, its doors are marble, but its insides are soot. Saying that, yes, there's a great exterior to the structures because they're just stolen from local ruins, but the insides, you know, there's not much to speak of there at all. Now it's not just the Carthaginians or the ruins uh, of Carthage that are being used at Tunis, we know that Abdul Rahman III of Cordoba, for example, brought colored marble from Carthage from the Fatimid dynasty in the early to mid 10th century for the construction of Medina al Zahra, which you see here located in Cordoba. As early as the 10th century, therefore, we, we know that the marble of Carthage, which has already been pre cut, uh, which has already been quarried, can be shipped across the Mediterranean, at least to Spain, for the use of Muslim rulers who are looking to create their own uh, palatial complexes. At the same time though, Carthage is exceptional to some degree because of its size. It's so big that individual villages form in the pockets of its ruins, some of which develop distinctive names. The first of these names that I wanna introduce, really the only one that I'm gonna be talking about in any detail is Al Mualika which is, from what we can tell, the ruins of Carthage atop the Bursa Hill specifically. So the area where we see Phoenician ruins and where we see that Cathedral of Saint Louis. 
We know this from circumstantial evidence of the Arabic sources primarily. Al-Mu'alika itself means the hanging place. So Al-Mu'alika itself likely was sort of hanging over the other lands due to its elevation. You know, it's, it's, it's imposing itself over them. This was a, a location that had centuries and centuries of, of inhabitation. Uh, it features in the Aeneid, one of these foundational texts of ancient Rome. In the story, Queen Dido and her party were insultingly offered lands by local Berber chieftains around the Bursa Hill. And they said, oh, well, you can have as much land as you can cover with a single ox hide. The idea here being to insult Dido by saying you can only have, you know, a little strip of land that's the size of an ox. But she, savvy as she was, uh, uh, ordered that an ox hide be cut into tiny strips until the entire hill of the Bursa was encircled, thus creating this fortified settlement that persists through the medieval period. This elevated area commanded an imposing view of the lands around it, including the coast of the Mediterranean and eventually the city of Tunis itself. It's no surprise that this was a valuable city for the Carthaginians, Romans, and Muslims. It's possible for us to triangulate this site with some degree of uh, precision because al bakri describes a large theater to the west of Al-Mualika and ancient water storage facilities that are nearby it. Therefore, you can see on this map, it seems really likely that, you know, the Burza Hill is, uh, you know, directly east of the amphitheater. It's close to these cisterns. It makes sense in terms of just the site itself. So we have, like, with, with some degree of uh, precision, knowledge of where this, like, locus of power was uh, for Muslims. And we know that this area of Al-Mualika, even this fortress of Al-Mualika, gained some degree of regional importance in the 12th century under a leader named Muhriz ibn Ziyad. To explain and understand his rise in importance, we need to talk about a group called the Banu Halal. And this is, I believe, part of the, uh, the image that was advertised for this talk. The Banu Halal were a confederation of tribes, an Arab tribal confederation that migrated to Ifriqiya in the 11th century. They were initially based in the Arabian Peninsula, sort of modern day Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and Oman. Then they eventually migrated to Egypt where they settled west of the Nile. And then they eventually started moving west in the 12th century, or uh, sorry, in the 11th century into Ifriqiya. And when they moved into Ifriqiya, they brought immense political upheaval. And I think this image kind of tells, tells the whole story, which is of, uh, a Halali emir named Abu Zaid al-Halali chopping off the head of his rival Hijazi ibn Rafi. Uh, this group initially like went into Ifriqiya ostensibly fighting on behalf of local Berber lords as mercenaries, but they soon realized that they had considerable power on their own and they began conquering cities of their own for themselves, creating a relatively independent patchwork of city-states in which you had some uh, coastal cities governed by Berbers, which I mean here is like essentially indigenous North Africans. And then uh, in inland Ifriqiya, you have Hilali uh, leaders of the Banu Hilal who are, uh, who are in charge of like a city or a couple of cities. We know about this, uh, these conquests and this division from a chronicle named Ibn Khaldun. Who I'm gonna bring up a couple times in this talk. If you haven't like heard of this guy before, his name is spelled uh, Ibn Ibn Khaldun, K H A L D U N. He's one of these really foundational and really important characters in the history of medieval North Africa. He wrote a book called the Kitab Al Ibar, or the Book of Examples, and the introduction to that, the Muqaddima, is one of the most important texts of the medieval period because it just proposes this really fantastic theory of history that is unlike any that we see in medieval Europe. And it's this idea of there being, uh, of history being cyclical and, and of it being a story of conflict between nomadic groups and sedentary groups. Ibn Khaldun was well acquainted with the Banu Halal and knew all about their conquests. And he saw that this is part of like this recurrent theme of, of these like hardy nomadic groups who had real group solidarity. It's an Arabic word called asabiyah that he loves. And they have the solidarity and they, they come in and they just displace these weak sedentary peoples who've grown accustomed to 
all of the frivolous sort of uh, excesses of urban life. But then what happens is that the nomadic peoples who conquer the cities over the course of three or four generations, they gradually succumb to the same pleasures of the city. And this leaves them vulnerable to invasions from uh, just another nomadic group. And it's a kind of a beautiful theory for the time in which he was writing because we had seen this with the Muslim conquest of North Africa. We see it with the Beno Halal in North Africa. We see it with the Almoravids and the Almohad in Spain. We see it with the Mongols. There are all these great examples it really stops working once gunpowder is invented. But for the time being, Ibn Khaldun had this theory that incorporated the Ben Hulal into this larger framework of nomadic peoples displacing sedentary peoples before falling prey to this uh, sedentary lifestyle themselves. One such ruler among the Banu Hulal who invaded these territories was Mukhriz ibn Ziyad. And we know a little about his genealogy, but unfortunately, we don't have any pictures of him. We only have uh, words and maps, which is really the majority of, of what I have visually for you this lecture. And we know that he was a member of the Banu Halal, this overarching confederation of tribes. Uh, Banu in Arabic means tribe. And then he was part of a subsect of that tribe called the Banu Riyah. And then he was part of a further subsect of that tribe called the Banu Ali. And then there was him who was part of this. And we can see here just the level of fragmentation within the Banu Halal in that they may be one overarching group, but by the time we get to Mukhriz ibn Ziyad, there's dozens of these Halali emirs running around trying to jockey for control over land in North Africa. Mukhriz is important for us because he governed specifically, we know he governed from Al Mu'alika atop the Bursa Hill. He was located therefore very close to Tunis, but it's clear that even though he was next to this major urban center, he still exercised considerable power. And he had this really uneasy relationship with local lords in nearby Tunisia. At one point, he was invited by Tunis to govern local leaders, but was booted out by the population who didn't want to submit to rule by an Arab, because at this point, Tunis was ruled by a Berber group. But still at other times, he cooperated with armies based in Tunis to attack other leaders who had made fortresses along the Zagwan aqueduct and use those bases to conduct raids on agricultural lands. Mukhriz was also pulled into a larger conflict between two major Berber tribes, the Zirids and the Hamadids. Now I know I'm giving you a lot of names and uh, tribal affiliations at this point. It's not really important to internalize all of these. What I want you to take away is that Mukhriz has power despite being in a localized place next to a big city like Tunis. So these two groups, the Zirids and Hamadids, were cousins, Berber cousins, and they were constantly fighting for control of North Africa. Here we have a map uh, of the two, kind of uh, in the early 11th century. And these, these two groups, uh, they're, they're constantly trying to jockey for power using whatever other leaders they can at their disposal. And eventually Tunis kind of becomes a pivoting point for the conflict between them. And Mukhriz ibn Ziyad serves as a loyal ally of the Zirid emirs and wins numerous victories on their behalf against the Hamadids and their allies. We get a sense of how like close the relationship between these two dynasties was because when the last Zirid emir uh, was kicked out of his capital, ancestral capital at Madia by the Normans of Sicily, the Zirid emir sought refuge with Mukhriz ibn Ziyad at Amualika in the ruins of Carthage. From this, we can infer that he, he must have had people uh, in his land. He must have had some form of like really legitimate army backing him, right? And for that, there needs to be some sort of infrastructure. Armies just don't emerge from the ground. So he had to have groups that, like this group of soldiers that he could train, that he could pay for. How do you pay for an army? Well, you need plunder from combat, which he clearly had. But also more consistently, you need some sort of economic engine to feed and drive them. And it's from this that we can uh, see that he would use the marble at his disposal as a way of funding his army, as a way of just ensuring his own uh, continued existence. This is from al once again, writing about the ruins of Carthage. Carthage is currently ruined, but there is one estate that is inhabited called Almualika. It is surrounded by an earthen wall and occupied by Arab chiefs known under the name of Banu Ziyad, hence Muhriz ibn Ziyad. When Carthage flourished, 
The city was one of the most famous in the world because of its astonishing buildings and the grandeur of power which its monuments attested. Remarkable remains of Roman constructions can still be seen there today. For example, the theater, which has no equal in magnificence in the universe. Excavations in its ruins are always happening without interruption. The removal of marble from there does not cease and its marble is carried to all regions of the earth. One does not depart from there in a ship or by other means unless they carry with them some of its marble in large quantities. Carthage has become well known for this. Now, we don't have a ton of evidence like from medieval North Africa compared to a lot of other places in the medieval world. Uh, we're getting a lot more written sources generally in the 12th century, but for Ifriqiya, we're reliant on two or three really major sources. But from al -Adrisi, I mean, it seems to me pretty irrefutable that we have Mufariz ibn Ziyad controlling this economic engine based at Carthage that is exporting marble from Roman ruins to other places to fund his own, uh, his own sort of nascent state. This shows us the importance of uh, ruins as an economic engine and their potential use for defense. It also testifies to the very fractured political landscape of Ifriqiya at this time. The Banu Halal had broken the uh, borders of these Berber states like the Zirids and Hamadids, and in its stead we have really lo localized power, which includes uh, not only like lords in Tunis, but lords in nearby Al Mualika, and then individual lords located along the Zagwan aqueduct that I referred to briefly before. We know from textual sources, therefore, that Muhriz was a fairly prominent local lord, but written materials from medieval North Africa are pretty sparse, and it behooves us to look at material culture evidence, which is likewise spotty, but is still evocative. So we have headstones found around the Bursa Hill from excavations in the 19th century, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. They're likely from the 12th century, and you see them in this picture, uh, in the top left. These are from the Bursa, medieval Islamic tombstones from Delatra's excavations of 1893 to 1896. Now, we don't know enough about the styles of these tombstones to be able to specifically date them to the reign of Muhriz or to maybe someone who ruled around his time. But they're evocative and show some degree of interaction and artistic specialization. The image on the bottom right that you see is a similar looking tombstone from, uh, uh, from Malta, a nearby island uh, that we know is from the 12th century. And this Malta headstone shows us that, okay, well, there's interactions happening and there's at least some artistic similarities circulating in this uh, sort of cemetery based architecture between these ruins of Carthage and between Malta. It's our hope that additional work on tombstones in Malta and uh, Ifriqiya will reveal connections between the two and maybe help shine some light on, you know, when some of these tombstones were produced, who was ruling at the time, and that sort of thing. You see here um, a screenshot from a, a page on the International, or the Institute for Digital Exploration at USF, which is a program of which I'm a, I'm a part. I'll show you the webpage uh, briefly. Let me just get out of uh, PowerPoint really quickly. Y'all can still see, see my screen, right? You can see the website that I'm on right now. Great, yes, good, great. So this is the IDEX homepage. And if you go to collections and go down to this larger project we're doing on Roman Malta and medieval Malta and browse the collection, you can see work that we're currently doing on 3D scanning. Now, most of this came from uh, work in the summer of 2019, and uh, the goal was to continue over the next couple summers, but that obviously uh, very quickly went awry. Scrolling down though, you can see some of the work that we've been doing on these Muslim tombstones. The goal of which is to contextualize them in the greater artistic environment of the Mediterranean, including not only Ifriqiya, but also Spain, also uh, modern day Morocco. And so, whereas my, my PowerPoint sort of gave you a, a drawing of what a North African tombstone from the time of Mukhriz might have looked like, we can see uh, you know, some better quality ones here. And when we load this 3D model, uh, which is through Sketchfab, 
you can get a sense, give it one second while it loads, uh, of what these look like. Uh, it's, you know, it's really high quality scans. You can see here, this one doesn't have any Arabic text on it. It probably did at one point that was painted on, but now it's long worn away. But we have these geometric designs uh, on it. And yeah, you're able to, to rotate and get a sense of it, really everything except for its weight. So the goal of one of our current projects is to examine these uh, tombstones and dialogue with one another to try to better understand not only the material culture environment of Muslims in Malta, but also Muslims of medieval North Africa. Now, Muhriz ibn Ziyad uh, governed from al Mualika throughout the 1150s. Um, you're able to see this PowerPoint, right? This is, this is I'm back there. I wanna make sure I didn't lose anyone. Yes, great, thank you, Sherry. Uh, Muhriz governed from al Mualika throughout the 1150s, and then he led a number of Ifriqian armies into battle against a group called the Almohads who come from uh, modern day Southern Morocco. He didn't want them to take over these lands and he helped unite a number of tribes to resist them. He was successful on a couple of occasions, uh, but eventually was defeated in 1160 at the Battle of Horn Mountain near Kairouan. And his head was put on a pike by the Almohads to send a message to any would-be Ifriqian resistors. The reason I bring up this rather grisly detail is because if there's one little lord based in the ruins of Carthage that can sort of get this level of like, get this reaction out of a group as powerful as the Almohads, it means that you could really hold power in Carthage uh, during the 12th century. And his life, I hope, broadly shows us that hundreds of years after the fall of Roman Carthage, the city's ruins were still important economic and defensive drivers in the region. The death of Mukhras did not spell an end to Amalika, though, although it seems like it probably declined in importance gradually. We know that during the Tunis Crusade of Louis the Ninth in 1270, there was fierce fighting around the fortress. Though at this point, uh, Al Mualika was controlled by the forces of Tunis. In the intervening century between this event and Mukhras's death, Tunis had grown in size and had enveloped the ruins of Carthage as its own. Subsequent centuries saw Al Mualika recede in importance. Ibn Idari, who wrote in the early 14th century, said it had fallen into disrepair and was without inhabitants. Ibn Abi Dinar, who wrote in the 17th century, called it a pile of ruins compared to what he had been expecting to find after reading the earlier geography of al Bakri. Still, these ruins provided economic opportunities for nearby inhabitants. I mentioned Ibn Khaldun and his cycle of history. Uh, he mentions the ruins of Carthage specifically when discussing the ways in which dynasties rise and fall. Monuments owe their origin to the power that brought the dynasty into being. The impression the dynasty leaves is proportionate to that power. The monuments of a dynasty are its buildings and large edifices. They're proportionate to the original power of the dynasty. They can materialize only when there are many workers and united action and cooperation. When a dynasty is large and far flung with many provinces and subjects, workers are very plentiful and can be brought together from from all sides and regions. Thus, even the largest monument can materialize. One may also compare the nave of Awalid in Damascus, the Umayyad Mosque in Cordoba, the bridge over the river at Cordoba, and as well, the arches of the aqueduct over which water is brought into Carthage, the monuments of Churchill in the Maghreb, the pyramids of Egypt, and many other such monuments that may still be seen. What this tells us is that Ibn Khaldun, who lived in North Africa in the 14th century, thought that the aqueduct bringing, uh, that used to bring water into Carthage is comparable in importance and scope to the Great Pyramids of Giza, to the Grand Mosque of Cordoba, to these real like monuments of the ancient medieval world. Ibn Khaldun further remarks that people of Tunis preferred to tear down the arches of the Zagwan aqueduct rather than to quarry and cut stones themselves. He even mentions in the first person that he witnessed this many times as a child and that the strength of the architecture of these buildings is such that only a few stones fall at a time after much effort. This testifies to the you know, engineering know-how of the, of the Romans for sure, but also the importance of these ruins as ways for people to get cheap stone instead of quarrying it and taking it from far afield. 
The ruins of Carthage continued to serve as a suburb of Tunis across the early modern period. They provide a great place for home and to keep livestock. Now we might know a whole lot more about Mukhriz and the other Muslim inhabitants of Al Mualika were it not for French colonial scholars. In 1830, the Bay of Tunis permitted the French government to construct a church in the memory of King Louis IX at a location at La Malka, as they called it. This they did atop the Bursa Hill, initially the rather humble Ancienne Chapelle Saint Louis in the middle of the 19th century, a postcard of which you see here. This La Malka is, I think, pretty clearly a Francification of the term Al Mualika. Uh, and provides further evidence that this site of Al Mualika was atop the Bursa Hill. This act of construction uh, served to, you know, destroy much of the Muslim evidence of Muslim inhabitation from previous centuries, which the French were not really much concerned about. That would be one thing, but this uh, chapel of St. Louis was followed by uh, the much more imposing Cathedral of Saint Louis, which stands today, which was constructed at the end of the 19th century. Both of these structures were meant to commemorate King Louis IX, who I mentioned earlier and his crusade in 1270. He died on this crusade, potentially atop the Bursa Hill. It's unclear based on uh, surviving crusade chronicles. French control of the Bursa Hill radically changed the landscape. We have new structures, substantial gardens, that eliminated traces of earlier inhabitation. Archaeological work of this era too was very sloppy by modern standards. Scholars cared more about Christian and Roman artifacts than Muslim ones in a, in a pretty major way. Attempted unearthing ancient artifacts provided that provided evidence of Christianity and the persecution of Christians effectively destroyed evidence of Muslim inhabitation. The French in general saw themselves as inheritors of the Roman Empire, and they wanted desperately to show connections between their regime of the 19th century and the ancient Roman regime. They did so by effectively obliterating trace of Muslim inhabitation between the Romans and the modern French state. And this is just one aspect of a really insidious colonial regime that was responsible not only for the persecution and suffering of millions in modern day North Africa, but also the destruction of their cultural heritage. This process of destroying, uh, destroying uh, sort of early Muslim inhabitation uh, evidence of that in North Africa was common throughout French colonies. In the case of uh, Carthage, one second, there we go. Okay, in the case of Carthage, the pioneer, pioneering archeologist was a guy named Alfred Louis de Latre, who was a missionary to Algeria who eventually became chaplain of the Cathedral of Saint Louis. Now, his work sort of undoes a lot of what we maybe would want to see, uh, you know, from modern archeology. span So here's the cisterns of La Malga, right? Here's what it looks like in the upper left, and here's what it looks like sometime in the late 19th century. You can see here, this was used by a local Muslim inhabitant as a house. We can see the door. We know that livestock was kept there. But in excavating the site and only looking for the sort of ancient core of the city, they essentially just got rid of the stuff they didn't deem worthwhile. And archaeology, unfortunately, is destructive science. Once you lose track of the provenance of objects, their utility is severely limited. In the case of Delatra and his, his contemporaries, they're really just concerned about finding artifacts that testify to Christian inhabitation. Here is Alfred Louis de Latre, who I mentioned was a missionary to Algeria and then the chaplain of this cathedral of Saint Louis. You can see his uh, garbs there are similar to the, the garbs we see in the bottom right hand corner. Really, de Latre saw Muslim inhabitation as an obstacle to excavating earlier settlements. Here's one thing that he wrote in one of his uh, field reports. Many Madonna's images statues, statuettes, medals, rosaries, and scapulars must have been brought to the towns of the Mediterranean coast, and the fanatic iconoclasm of the Muslims could not have succeeded in destroying everything. So he blames Muslims for destroying Christian artifacts, and then he sort of, you know, eye for an eye mentality 
he destroys Muslim artifacts in search of these Christian ones. The clear focus of his work was Christian and Muslim inhabitation, but he still couldn't help but uncover a few Muslim artifacts along the way. Earlier, I had shown you a headstone uh, from Delatra's excavations of 1893 to 1896, uh, which are I currently housed in a museum in, in somewhere in Tunis. Tracking down the location of these muse these headstones has been really tough, especially without being able to physically visit there. So I'm very much in the process of trying to get a better sense of where, where these items are. Uh, and, and, and what he's doing here is like, take like looking seeing like islamic artifacts and taking them removing them from their context which is what makes them valuable and then talking about the cold of the virgin in africa which is what he is much more concerned about and generally what we are contending with here is that is is that archaeology of the muslim period in north africa is still really in its infancy compared to what's happening in, in Europe where there's been a lot more archeological work. There's, there's some reasons for this, like colonialism, the emphasis on medieval studies in, in Western Europe are all reasons. And then there's some environmental ones too. Uh, the sand, the, the, the bedrock of uh, North Africa doesn't like preserve stratigraphic layers as well as somewhere like Sicily or the, the bogs of, of Northern Europe. And so it's more difficult to, to do anything with some of the sites. Studies over the last 30 years uh, have helped us better understand some of these settlement patterns of early medieval Carthage, but this still pales in comparison uh, to what we have elsewhere in the medieval Mediterranean. And if nothing else, uh, I hope this talk is a plea for more work to be done on the material culture of Muslim groups in North Africa, whether it's looking at Mukhriz located in the ruins of Carthage or some other Muslim lords that are testified in the written sources, but about whose uh, lives we have very little from environmental ones. So to re-summarize the, the thesis statement, if you will, of this talk, the ruins of Carthage in modern day Tunisia had a vivid afterlife in the medieval period as a source of marvel for local leaders and occasionally as a locus of power in the politically decentralized landscape of medieval North Africa. Unfortunately, the mark that many of these leaders left on the landscape has been minimized by French colonial archeologists who were so determined to find evidence of Christian and Roman inhabitation at Carthage that they destroyed stratigraphic layers that testified to the presence of Muslim activity in these ruins. Thus, we have two kinds of pillaging here. The medieval pillaging of ancient ruins that fed the economy of people living among Roman ruins and colonial pillaging of the history of these medieval Muslims whose remains were destroyed by French archeologists. That is what I have prepared for all of you today. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'm happy to field questions, comments, rebuttals, uh, corrections as you as you see fit. So thank thanks to all of you for being here. Looking forward to your questions. <laughs>